I was camping in a secluded nature reserve with my friend Mo at a place called Bear Valley that looks like this. This place was so remote that cell phones didn't get any signals, and we were basically on our own, a day away from the nearest town. Uh, we had gone there to sample some insects because Mo and I were both hardcore entomologists. <laughs> it was our first night at Bear Valley, and we were trying to go to sleep at 9 p.m., and this is how Bear Valley looks at 9 p.m. <laughs> we were in our sleeping bags, and we heard a noise from right outside the tent, we both sat up really alarmed by what sounded like a large animal huffing around the tent. I whispered, what's that? <laughs> Mo said, shh, shh. The huffs gradually got stronger until the tent wall started to move a little bit as the animal explored the tent from outside. We didn't want to make a noise and trigger the animal, but we managed to silently get our pepper spray out of the backpack and aim it towards the animal. You know, birds are huge and their claws are this long and sharp, and with one hit, they could split your face in half. So this tiny canister of pepper spray was the only thing standing between us and the potential bear right outside our flimsy tent. At this point, we were regretting our decision to come to this insect collection trip, but there was no way out. Mo looked at me with a startled look, and I looked right back at Mo. Mo is a super nerd just like me, but he's taller and stronger than I am. He's a little more serious and bossy, but he's a very capable and helpful guy. We were both 20 years old, just done with our sophomore year of undergrad in biology, and we decided to do a project on insect diversity. Our goal was to see a lot of cool insects, but we also had a secret ulterior motive, getting into a pristine nature reserve that only a few scientists were allowed to enter to do research. To get into the reserve, we wrote up a proposal to create a catalog of all insect species occurring in it. The reserve was an intersection of mountains, plains, with wet and dry climates converging, and it had 10 different types of habitats, which is insanely high for its size. We planned to sample from each habitat for three days, so we would be in the reserve for a full month. Good holidays. We sent this proposal to the Na Natural Reserves Agency, and in it we said, Insects are diverse, abundant, and important. If we don't know what we have, we cannot know how to save them. Plus, we can make identifying species easier for everyone by creating a searchable database of DNA sequences instead of going through old books of descriptions of wing structure and insect genitalia. <laughs> identifying 100 samples with our method would only take two hours instead of two months. So the agency gave us the green light to enter the park and asked park rangers to transport us between our sampling sites. And when the rangers transported us, they would just drop us off at a site with all of our insect sampling gear and come pick us up three days later. We knew there were some risks associated with insect collection, stinging hornets, uh, assassin bugs, virus-carrying mosquitoes. But the real danger in this reserve was the large predatory mammals, burrs, wolves, and leopards. Ten days into our journey, we got to our fourth habitat on the list, which was grassland, and we had picked Bear Valley because it was so isolated. The rangers dropped us off on a small dirt road, and we had to walk the rest of the way with all of our gear. Each of us carried around 50 pounds. Uh, we had a tent, three days' worth of food and water, plus all of our insect sampling gear. Uh, you know insects. Insects live everywhere. Above ground, underground, on trees, and even underwater. And to catch them all, we had different kinds of traps and nets and containers and chemicals to preserve the samples in. Some insects live at night, and we collected them too with light traps. We had three types of light traps. Big UV lights for attracting moths and lacewings onto huge white sheets, small ground lights for ants, stink bugs, and beetles, and finally a large and very bright white lamp uh, that attracted flies, wasps, and mantids. The lamp was surrounded by a chemical compound called ethyl acetate, which smells like nail polish remover. Uh, it's highly volatile, very flammable, and toxic to insects. And we used it to paralyze the insects so they would fall into the traps collection tube. <coughs> to operate these lights out in the bush, we had a gasoline generator, which was the hardest thing to carry around, and Mo and I each held one side of it when we were moving it. After being dropped off by the road, to get to Bear Valley, uh, we trekked lots of steep downhill, then some moderate uphill, then again some downhill, until we arrived at a stream. We couldn't carry the generator uh, across the water, so we left it there and crossed uh, with all the lighter gear uh, to camp about 100 meters uphill. It was late summer, and dry grasses stretched on for miles. So we made a clearing, set up our tent, set all the insect traps, 
had some stale bread for lunch and time for collecting insects by hand. By dusk, we had collected a lot of samples. We were super hungry, so we had some canned eggplants for dinner. Before it got totally dark, I filled the generator with gasoline and turned it on to power our light trap. And it usually burned a full tank in about three hours, so we had to refill it at midnight to keep collecting insects. Since the generator was on the other side of the stream, we had a dangling wire that transferred the electricity from the generator to our 800-watt bulb uh, for the light trap, which we set up near the stream because our wire was short. And water attracted more insects also. We hung the light trap from a thick branch of a tree and headed back to the, uh, to the tent to sleep. And this was when the whole sniffing fiasco happened. Um, the animals sniffed around our tent but didn't find any food because we knew better. We had uh, hidden our food somewhere else. And after a few minutes of huffing, uh, the animal disappeared. But at midnight, we still had to go refill the generator. We were really scared. But Mo gave me a 10-minute pep talk and convinced me that we should really riffle uh, the generator. So we got out of the tent and slowly walked down to the stream. We looked around to make sure there are no bears or leopards or wolves around. It took us three minutes to walk 100 yards in the sheer darkness down to the stream. And with every snap of a twig under our feet, we were turning to see if there's a burr or a leopard behind every bush. <laughs> As we got closer to the light trap, we started to feel safer because animals are afraid of the generator's noise and the light also. But when we got to the generator, its gasoline had already run out. So it was pitch black and silent. We got really nervous again, and I wanted to get the light back on as fast as possible. So I jumped across the stream, filled the generator with gasoline, and at the same time, Mo refilled the ethyl acetate container beneath the light bulb, and lights were back on. Yes, we did it. No more fear of bears. I jumped back to this side of the stream, and now that there was some light to see with, I looked around and could see all the harmless bushes with no bears hiding behind them. I tripped over the wire. It all went in a flash. The trap was hung from a branch. The wire was pulled. The trap went sideways. The highly flammable ethyl acetate splashed on the height light bulb. The bulb exploded. The whole container of fiery ethyl acetate flew in all directions. In about three seconds, we had a blazing fire with a radius of a few feet growing at a rate of a foot per second in dry grass. We knew we had to do something, but we were so shocked. We froze for a few seconds and just looked at the fire that was rapidly growing. Fire is a creature of wonder. <laughs> Each fire has a character based on the material that's burning, wind speed, and temperature. This fire was flat and didn't emit too much light, but it was hot and jumped around with the burning pieces of grass that were soaring in the warm air current above the fire. We really didn't have much time to put it out, otherwise it would grow so much that we couldn't control it anymore, and it would burn miles of grassland surrounding us. All we had to put it out with was our clothes, but I remembered we had some sheets we used for the UV light traps, but we kept those near the tent. So I just shouted at Mo, I'm gonna get the sheets, and sprinted the 100 yards back to the tent while Mo started extinguishing the fire with his jacket. I ran up the dark hill full of obstacles to our tent in 20 seconds, grabbed a couple of sheets, and sprinted down the dark hill full of obstacles in 20 seconds, and threw one of the sheets at Mo, and bit by bit, we smothered the fire. The funny thing is, as soon as the fire started, we were no longer thinking about any animals attacking us. <laughs> we were just afraid of having burnt the most valuable piece of land. We didn't even realize, until much later, that we could have totally died in that fire. <laughs> I actually ran for my life 100 yards uphill in about 20 seconds, and I can't comprehend how my body did that. And I owe my life to an autopilot brain. Mo and I didn't speak much in the days that followed, but rather wondered about the disaster we almost caused, but this event connected us so deeply that we were still best friends. We continued the project and did the rest of our sampling at the reserve and then back to the lab to sequence DNA. But the lab was now too boring for us. <laughs> and had no excitement compared to the valleys and plains of the reserve. I learned that you can never predict everything, and sometimes, no matter how much you prepare, still things can go horribly wrong. This is a lesson that working in lab could have never taught me. Thank you. That was Bamp first timer, Baron Karadmond! <laughs>